Good morning again. My name is Cal Lord. Most of you know me because you are here regularly, whether you are in the sanctuary or you are uh, watching from home today. And as we get ready to begin our worship service this morning, I want to just share a couple of announcements. Um, we have tried or we've been planning on moving our parking lot service to 8 a.m., and with the pandemic, shipping has been all messed up. We were supposed to receive our radio transmitter on Wednesday, and it didn't come. And so instead of trying to wake up all the neighbors and cause all kinds of grief, we said we're going to postpone it, and hopefully we'll have it early this week. And for those of you who like to be in the parking lot, it'll be a little cooler, and you'll be able to worship in the comfort of your car if you'd like to be uh, close to us here. So we're going to try again for next week. So I apologize for those who are at home and we're hoping to, to be here. Also, I want to just let you know that we have a lot of birthdays this week that we're celebrating. Um, and uh, Jackie Turner, who has helped us most of the, the spring with some of our broadcasts, Jackie has a birthday this week, and so a very happy birthday to Jackie. Uh, John Mathewson has a birthday. I can't believe it, but I heard John's going to turn 80 uh, on Monday. And so we uh, celebrate and we rejoice with John. I want to lift up George Champlin. George has a birthday this week. I know he doesn't look a day over 49, but he may have a few more years than that on him. But uh, again, happy birthday. Elizabeth Webster, happy birthday to you, Elizabeth. Uh, Fritz Eckel has a birthday this week. Uh, Diane Johnson, who's probably watching at home, Diane has a birthday this week. Ruth Brayman, who is at the uh, Apple Watch Hill, has a birthday. Uh, Barry Bennett, our good friend down at Babcock Village, has a birthday. Ashley Terwilliger, uh, Skip's daughter, has a birthday this week. Um, Scott Green has a birthday, and so does Kelly White. And so it's a big week for a lot of people, and we pray that they just have a great, great birthday celebration this week. Also, I want to remind you that we do have services on Wednesday night at 6.30, if you'd like to join us either here or on Facebook or on Thursday, you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, that's a Wednesday night. And during the month of July, we are collecting our special One Great Hour of Sharing offering. Uh, I think that those who are here today were able to pick up an envelope down below at the back entranceway. If you'd like to make an offering to the One Great Hour of Sharing. If you're at home, you can always send a check into Central Baptist Church and just put One Great Hour in the memo line. Uh, this is one of our four uh, annual offerings for the American Baptist Church's USA. It's a 100% offering, and the money collected through the One Great Hour goes to disaster relief. Some of it will actually be going to, to areas where this pandemic has caused great strife. Um, so if you'd like to do that, that's a wonderful offering to make. Well, I'm going to uh, turn things over now to uh, our lay assistant, Steve Burnside, as we begin our worship. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all here and all you people online. Uh, we miss seeing everybody up close and personal, but we'll be there soon enough. Soon enough. Uh, this week I've been thinking a lot about um, o obedience, which is part of the way uh, the Lord wants us to be, obedient to his word. So this is what I came up with for my prayer of invocation, and then we'll go on to the Lord's Prayer. And bow our heads. O oh, gracious Lord, give us strength to obey your command to speak of this life, to remain determined to obey God rather than man. Lord, we pray that you will teach us to recognize and live out our faith amidst oppression, however it comes upon us. Lord, teach us to be buoyant and joyous and effervescent for Jesus, whom taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. During the course of the uh, pandemic, I have been sending out daily updates to folks at home by email and for those who don't really do email, we send out uh, the bulletin and the sermon in print. 
Uh, if you would like to have either of those things, call the church office and we can add you to my update list or to the uh, mailing list for our bulletins and our sermons. Also, if, uh, if you're on my update list, usually on Friday I send out a copy of the order of service so you can then follow along, especially if you're watch, watching from home. So call the office and let us know. Again, a lot of things are opening up here. Uh, the Wednesday night services, we have the church library that's open most mornings and also the prayer chapel. And I'm also available for either a Zoom pastoral visit or maybe an in-home visit, maybe out on the porch or the deck. Uh, call the office if you'd like me to come by. We can wear masks and be socially distant, but uh, uh, we thank God for that. I want to um, invite you now to sing our first song of the morning. It's number 580, Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult. Jesus Calls Us. We're going to be singing, I think it's verses 1 and 2. If you're standing, please be seated. As we come together today, we have some prayer concerns to share. Maybe you have some burdens that you're carrying. I uh, remember years ago, I heard a pastor invite us to come and to lay our burdens at the foot of the cross. And so today, I invite you, if you've got something that's heavy and weighing on your heart, to give it to Jesus. Don't try carrying it alone. Jesus, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And so uh, I want to just invite you to offer your prayers to the Lord. I want to lift up a couple people in particular that uh, I've received calls on. I want to think of Evelyn LeBlanc in our prayers this morning. Evelyn is at the Westerly Hospital, and, uh, and she's failing. Um, she uh, had uh, a broken hip, and then she had an embolism, and some of her organs have been shutting down, and she just said she's tired. We know Evelyn's faith is strong, and so we pray for her. We know that when that time comes, we know where she's going and who she's going to be with. We pray for her, her family. She has been a rock, a source of inspiration and hope and encouragement to all of them, and so we pray that God will be with them as they come to this time and give them a sense of his presence. I want to also lift up John Millette. I got a call from John uh, on my answer machine, and uh, John had a, another heart attack a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was in the hospital, and now he's uh, in a nursing home in Mystic, and he just asked for prayers today. And so if we'll think of John, John's a young man. He's in his mid-50s. Uh, he's been battling with a stroke for a number of years. He's had some disabilities, uh, but he's always had a good spirit, but he said he's just afraid 
and he covets our prayers. And so we lift up uh, John Millett today. Want to lift up also Katie Feinstein, who was at L and M Hospital. That's a good friend of Hannah. Hannah Gibson called me yesterday afternoon and uh, just asked for prayers for Katie. And so we lift her up today. Uh, we'll lift up Zach Stanton. Zach is our our custodian. And Zach had uh, a spell this week. He went to the doctors. They really couldn't find anything wrong, but it, it seemed very serious. And uh, he seems to be better now, but we want to pray for healing for Zach in our prayers. I uh, want to also continue to lift up the Engler family in our prayers. Uh, we know that God is visiting their home and we're with them uh, as they go through some challenges right now. I want to lift up Norm Stedman uh, in our prayers. And Margaret Brown, Katie Burnside's mom. Um, she is, uh, she's just waiting for the Lord to take her home. I want to lift up also Vivian and Janet and Mark, uh, three friends of our congregation who are in need of prayer today. I want to lift up Marie Caradillo in our prayers. Uh, Marie is again, Sandy Christina's daughter, and she's just been struggling with physical, uh, difficulties and just we, we need the spirit of encouragement to come to their home right now. I tried to get over to see her last week and it didn't work out, so we're hoping this week I can make a visit and uh, would just continue to pray for her. One lift up uh, uh, Nate Hamlet and Hallie and Michael Payne. One lift up uh, Debbie Plant. Debbie called. Debbie is going in for a surgical procedure on Monday, and so we pray for Debbie and we pray for Don as well. And we continue to lift up Ben Fran French and Mark Underwood, Jenny White, Esther Nachi, Rosanna, Rosa Scarano, and David Johnson. And maybe you have some folks on your heart and mind today that you've been thinking of. And so we add them to our prayer list. We lift up our nation as we continue to, to struggle to find a, a way to resolve some of the injustices. And we pray for some some reconciliation to take place in those places where, where hurt and pain have been suffered. And we pray for peace, peace in the heart and also peace in our land. And again, we pray for an end to this pandemic. We would pray for those who are researching, the scientists, the doctors who are trying to find treatments. We pray for our educators, even as we, we start talking about what's next for our children and our college students. We pray for wisdom for those who are making decisions. We pray for our Congress, we pray for our president, and we pray for our world this day. And so let's come together in that spirit of prayer, and then we will close with our congregational prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that when we come seeking you, we find you. And Lord, even if we can't see you, the scriptures tell us that you are there. In Psalm 139, it says that when we rise up in the morning or when we lie down at night, you are there. That we can't hide from you. That you follow us to the ends of the earth and to the depths of Sheol. Oh Lord, we're reminded so often in the scriptures of how much you love us, but nowhere so well as in the Gospel of John where it says you love the world so much that you gave your only begotten Son, that all who would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Lord, sometimes in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of injustice and cruelty in the world around us, Lord, it's words like that that remind us that you are in control, and that you hold us in the palm of your hand. When we're battling illness, whether it be cancer or something else, Lord, and we have those long nights where we can't sleep and we shiver in our sheets, Lord, we know that you are with us, resting by our bedside. So, Lord, when we lift up those that we love and care about, we know, Lord, that you are present with them as well. Oh, Lord, we would pray for healing for everyone. We would pray, Lord, that they might rise up out of their bed like they did when Jesus gave the command. But even if that doesn't happen, Lord, we know that you hold our future. And, Lord, we thank you for the possibilities that it has. 
whether it be here, as Paul says, in life and in death, we belong to you. And Lord, so today we give all of these names, these people to you, the ones listed publicly and those that we've lifted up in our hearts, knowing that you are good and that you will take care of these things. Lord, hear our prayer. As we come together as people of faith this day, help us to be your body in the world. Show us the way that we can be your presence wherever we are, at work, in our homes, with our families, in the community where we serve. Help us to be your hands and your feet, bringing justice, bringing mercy, and showing the world through our actions the love of God. Lord, hear our prayer, even now as we join together with one voice. Father, help us to tune out the world filled with chaos and the voices that stir up fear so we can hear you speak to our hearts. Lead us along your paths of truth, O Lord. We put our trust in you alone. Amen. Thank you. I want to just take a moment to talk to the children uh, I, I brought something with me that uh, one of these things in my office that hangs on my wall very proudly, and I don't know if you can see it, but it's a plaque that I received a long time ago. Back when I was about 27 or 28 years old, the Rotary Club in Norwich asked me if I would be their incoming president. I remember going home and telling Lori about it, and I said, oh, guess what? They asked me to be the president. I can't believe it. And you know what she said to me? She said, well, that's because they knew you couldn't say no. Sometimes when we are called upon to serve, we think that it's only because there's nobody else or we're the only one, and so they had to choose us. But I want to tell you this, that when God calls you or me, and says, I want you to go out into the world and share my love. I want you to go out there and do something good that shows mercy and brings justice to a situation. God isn't choosing you because there was no one else. God is choosing you because he believed in you. And it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are. David was just a boy when he went up against Goliath, and God chose him. So boys and girls, he can choose you as well. And he's not just doing it because you can't say no, because you can say no. But God is hoping you and all of us will say yes when the call comes. Well, God bless you, boys and girls. I hope you're enjoying your summer. And I hope to see you soon as fall comes and we're all back to doing more of the things we like to do. Thank you. This morning we have a special treat as we have the opportunity to hear Michael Grillo share a song with us. i uh -huh. 
again. follow that up. Thank the Lord I'm reading scripture. We're going to start today with uh, two scripture readings, Matthew 9, 35 to 38, pages 1510 in our pew Bibles that we don't have. And then we're going to follow it up with Micah chapter 6, 6 verses 6 through 8. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Micah chapter six, verses six and eight. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn, my transgressions, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Have you ever been chosen to do something and you had no idea why they chose you? Well, that's what I was thinking when they called on me to serve as an officer and then president of the Rotary Club so many years ago. And, and of course, Lori's response was typical. You know, if you're married, you often have that other person who will be very honest with you. Uh, and I remember that day I was coming home and I was just glowing because I can't believe they asked me. And she said, yeah, 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 because they know you can't say no. But over time, I've learned that sometimes that is the case, that, that we do get asked to do things because we can't say no. Uh, but when we are asked to do things where someone sees within us the capability, the gift, the skill to do something, then it becomes a special sort of thing. You see, to be chosen is always a great honor. It means that someone sees something in you that is noble, worthy, and admirable. It doesn't mean that you're the greatest or the best at all things. It means that someone believes that you have the heart and the character to get things done. King David was a perfect example of that. He was far from a perfect man. But from the time that he was a child... Into his adulthood, he had a heart that was sold out on God. 
And despite whatever failings he had, God knew that he was the right person for the right time, for the right job. God has been calling people from the beginning of time, men and women like you and I, to serve him. From the call of Abraham to establish a nation of God's chosen people. To the call of Moses to set his people free. To the call of David to lead a mighty nation. God has looked at the hearts of men and women and called them to walk with him in his mission. When we talk about God, it should always be in context of his calling. You see, right from the beginning, God had a plan. And his plan was to establish a relationship with humanity. He established the garden so that we might walk with him and enjoy it. You and me, the beauty of creation. As we walk through that account in Genesis 1 and 2, we see that after each thing was created, God looked at it and said it was good. And then on the sixth day, he created humanity. The crowning achievement, the heart of his hearts, so that we might be with him forever. From the beginning, God has called us into this relationship, and his plan was for all creation to enjoy life with him forever. That never changed. Even after the fall of humanity, with all of its dire consequences, God never gave up on that dream. The Old Testament records God's efforts to reach out to a nation that would be a shining light to bring people back to Him, the nation of Israel. They were to be an example to the world of God's love and faithfulness. And certainly as we read through the Hebrew Scriptures, we see that because there were moments in their history when they seemed to reflect the glory of God so well. But we all know the story. They kept stumbling and falling away. They tarnished that relationship. So what happened? God then took things in His own hands, sent His own Son to reach out, to build a bridge, to pay a price that would restore the broken relationship and lead to reconciliation. Jesus, through His ministry, brought the focus back on restoring the relationship between God and humanity. He went through towns and villages preaching the good news about God's love for them. He saw their situations and he began healing every disease and sickness he encountered. In Matthew 9, 36 we read, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. When I think about what's happening in the world today, certainly in our nation. And you see so many people who are upset, who seem frustrated with systems, who seem angry with the world around them. I can only imagine what Jesus is thinking as He looks down and His heart is broken. If you had seen the crowd on that day when Jesus was speaking in Matthew 9, many of the people would have considered themselves doing fine. They probably weren't thinking of themselves as being lost. If you looked at the crowd as a whole, they would have seemed pretty united. They were coming to hear a message from Jesus, maybe to see Him perform a miracle. But they weren't thinking about their broken hearts, their frustrations and their pains. The few who were coming looking for healing probably were just hoping that maybe he could say a word and they would be better. But many of them probably didn't believe that was possible because they had faced so many disappointments in their life. As we looked at that crowd, you probably would have seen a crowd like maybe you see at one of the, the protests or rallies or, or maybe at a Red Sox game or, or a concert or even a church service. They came waiting in anticipation of some good news. And yet, Jesus looked at them and he saw their broken hearts. And the verse says, he had compassion on them. The truth is, is that God looks at our world as hurting and broken as it is. And he continues today still to have compassion. And that is what the good news is all about. The word compassion literally means to be moved in heart. 
When you have compassion for someone, you're compelled to do something for them. And Jesus saw that crowd, and he took on the role of the great shepherd to lead them forward and show them the way. You know the passion story. Jesus gave his life as an atonement for our sin. Now, they didn't get that. When he went to the cross, many wrote him off. They said, that's the end of it. But in heaven, that day a debt was paid, a bridge was built, and it became possible for all who believed to cross over and find a new, renewed relationship with God. It had been restored, and the luster had been restored to God and to the people's lives themselves. You know, meeting Jesus did that to people. How many times have we read of the encounters that Jesus had with people where they went away rejoicing and telling everyone what Jesus had done? Just a few weeks ago, we talked about the Samaritan woman at the well. She came uh, with her head down, her life a shadow, her past weighing her down. But she left with a kick in her step, a smile on her face, and a compassion, a compulsion to tell everyone what had happened. Nicodemus came at night with a multitude of questions. He came perplexed and struggling to make sense of what he was hearing about this man, Jesus. And he left with new insight. He left a changed man. The scriptures reveal that when Jesus died, it was him and Joseph of Arimathea who came to take his body and put it in the tomb. This happened time after time. Jesus saw people's pain frustration, anger, and he interceded and touched them with both literally and figuratively. The amazing thing is that what Jesus began in his earthly life, he passed on to you and me like a torch for our ministry in the church today. Someone once asked the question, they said, if the church is plan A and it fails, what's God's plan B? The answer is there is no plan B. God's plan is for the church of Jesus Christ to rise up and to be his body in the world. To have compassion on those who are hurting, those who are struggling, and to bring healing and to bring renewed relationship. This is the mission of his church Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. What Jesus was saying was that there is a world full of hurting, lost people just ripe for someone to come along with a word of hope that will bring them new life. But we need more people willing to answer the call to go out and serve His purposes. The harvest is plentiful. On Friday, I had a funeral for a man named Arthur Spielman. Now, I've known Arthur for probably more than 30 years. He was a farmer, and he knew about hard work. He knew about harvesting crops. He knew that there were seasons that demand our attention. He was up early in the morning to milk the cows, and sometimes he worked late at night to get the crops in the barn. Most of us don't really think about the produce, the milk, the things that we enjoy, we go to the grocery store. We go and we look at the milk and we say, gee, it's almost $3, that's a lot of money. Well, we don't think about the hard work that went into it. There were a lot of hands that had to touch it. Somebody had to plow a field. Somebody had to fertilize soil. Someone had to plant a seed. Someone had to pull out the weeds. Somebody had to pick up the crops. Somebody had to milk the cows. Someone had to process that milk and then send it to the stores. The truth is, if you don't have enough somebodies, a potentially great crop or harvest can be ruined and lost forever. And Jesus told them to pray for the Lord of the harvest that he would send more workers into the field. Now, whether we choose to be a worker or not depends a lot on what we believe that we're called to do as followers of Jesus. And whether we think that what we do will have a lasting impact. To so many in our churches today, following Jesus is defined as going to church service on a Sunday morning. Heard a lot of people say over the years, you know, I go to church every week. 
We spend an hour in church and then we return to whatever we were doing before. I love it. There are several books written about our ministry from Monday through Friday in the workplace. Or our ministry as young people out in, in the world. Because there is a deeper understanding that following Jesus means more than an hour a week. It means giving our life to Him and being ready to serve. From Sunday afternoon through the following Sunday morning, our life as Christians belonged to Him. Now, here's a confession. Since I joined the fire department a couple of years ago, I've slowly gotten more involved. At first, I'd show up once a month for the meeting. I'd sheepishly come in and find a place at the table. I'd come every so often, those first few months, kind of drop in and wave at everybody. After a few months, I began dropping in for the weekly training. I was quickly overwhelmed, I have to tell you that. I'm not, well, let me put it this way. My father used to say, when he would talk about me to his friends, Cal doesn't like to get his hands dirty. <laughs> And let me tell you about firemen. Firemen, they are all in. And they're grabbing things, they're fixing things, mechanical minds. And, and so I'd come in and I, I'd be overwhelmed at the training. And so I didn't come too often. I'd come once in a while just to kind of hang out and be there. After about six months, though, I started going to a few calls and feeling, well, what can I do? How can I help? And because I wanted to help, I started to go to training more regularly and began to learn some of the ways that I can help. I don't have to be the one that rushes in the building, the burning building. But I can be there as a support and encouragement to help those that do. I can be there to, at the ready if something needs to be done. Over time, I began to realize the more training I had, the more helpful I could be. I started going to more calls. I started stopping into the station to chat during the week in between the trainings just to get to know people. And now when I go to calls, I know I can be helpful, whether it's just directing traffic or dressing a hydrant. And I've slowly found my place and become a part of the team. Now I want you to know that Jesus is calling you and me to the harvest. People all around us are hurting. People are lost. All you need to do is to look around you and you can see the people, some of them in your own circle. You can see those who are out in the wider world marching in rallies and you know that their souls are troubled and they're looking for justice and they have no peace. The truth is that only God can bring both justice and peace to their souls. Jesus said to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers and he was hoping that we'd catch on because we are those workers and he was waiting for us to say, oh, here I am, send me. When he approached Moses and said to him, I want you to go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. You know, we think of Moses, big macho man, shouting out the commands that led to the ten plagues. But you know what Moses said? Moses said, I, you, you know, Lord... Thanks, but, 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 but I'm not much of a talker. <laughs> uh, maybe you better send someone else. And God said to him, Moses, I'm sending you. And don't worry, I will give you the words you need. I'm going to send your brother Aaron, and you will be able to fulfill that call. The truth is, he does the same thing in our lives. We may say, I'm, I'm, not, a good, I'm not a good spokesman. I, I'm not an apologist for God. I don't know the scriptures that well. The truth is, is that if God calls you to go and to minister and to be with someone who is hurting, God will give you the words. The Holy Spirit will fill you with just the right thing to say at the right time. And the truth is, and this is even more amazing, that if you get up in the morning and you say, Lord, here I am, I'm ready to go, God will send you into a place where you can be His voice to someone who is hurting. The truth is that God has a role for everyone to play. Paul shares the illustration of the parts of the body in his letter to the Corinthians. And he says, we all have a part to play. Sometimes when we think about serving God, we think you've got to be the voice. You've got to be the spokesman. Or sometimes we think we've got to be the hands. We've got to be out there moving and shaking things. 
But sometimes it's just the ear. When someone calls who is hurting and desperate, to be able to listen and to let them share their pain and then to assure them that God hears. Sometimes, sometimes it's to be a knee, to be able to bend and help someone kneel down to pray to the Lord. Sometimes it's a finger just to point people in the right direction. You can't be a Sunday morning couch potato and be a true follower of Jesus Christ. Even in the midst of a pandemic, you've got to be all in and prepared to answer the call when God gives it. You've got to find your role and a part to play. And if you ask God, He will show you that. The great prophet Micah, in responding to the question, what does God expect us to do? Not too long ago, Gary Engler leads a Sunday morning Bible study, and he, he did a study with a couple of helpers on the, the prophets in the Old Testament. I wish I could have been to some of those because some of these prophets really do speak to us down through the centuries and remind us of our call and of our place in God's kingdom. And Micah, Micah says to the people when that question comes up, he says, it's not your burnt offerings I want. What I want, what I expect of you as my people is to do what God has shown you is good. To act justly. To love mercy. And to walk humbly with your God. Micah was suggesting that God calls us to a full-time position as followers. And He calls us to live our lives in such a way that we become an influence in the world around us. So that when people see us, when they hear our names, they should think of someone who walks with Jesus and treats people right and is filled with grace and mercy to those who are hurting. Now, I know most of us still have a ways to go. But we can begin today by just committing a simple commitment to Christ to say, Lord, here I am. Help me to be one of your laborers. Because I see the harvest is full and I'm ready to serve. That's what Jesus did. There was a problem with sin. And Jesus said, here I am, send me. You may not be called upon to do what Jesus did, but we certainly can live like Jesus lived. So I encourage you, as we continue in these summer months, as the world around us seems to be in turmoil, to look for ways where you can seek justice, where you can be a person offering mercy and forgiveness to those who are hurting, and when you can walk with God from morning till night, Sunday through Sunday. May God bless you as you accept that calling to be a follower of our Lord. Amen. We're going to now close our service this morning by singing Living for Jesus, number 569.
So now go out and answer the call. God is calling you out to the harvest. Amen. I want to just remind you as we leave today uh, to wait for the ushers to help usher you out so we can keep the social distance. Once you get out into the fresh air out front or in the parking lot, you're welcome to talk to one another. Remember to wear your masks, wash your hands, and keep your distance until this pandemic is over. God bless. Thank you.